This is the video for section A 2.3 on viruses, which is a higher level topic. Let's first be clear that viruses are not at this time considered to be a living organism. They can do some of those functions of life, but not all of them. So they are not a living organism. They are not made out of cells. Okay, and we think that they probably evolved spontaneously several different times. So unlike living organisms that all came from one common ancestor, it's likely that viruses evolved spontaneously several times. That's the only way to explain all of their differences. Now again, theme A, all about unity and diversity. So viruses can be very different, but they do have some things in common. So we expect them all to be very, very small, less than 300 nanometers, so teeny tiny. Um, they don't grow like a normal organism would. It's a fixed size. It can either use DNA or RNA as its nucleic acid. So all viruses are composed of two basic parts, some kind of nucleic acid, whether that be DNA or RNA, and then some type of protein capsid. And that protein capsid is like the protein coat, okay, those repeating units on the outside. Even within those, different viruses have very different protein capsids, but they all have one. And they don't contain cytoplasm. Um, they also generally have very few, if any, enzymes, and that's because they get their host cells to do just about everything for them. So again, because of their multiple origins, we'll see lots of different uh, variety in these viruses. So even though all of them have genetic material, what that genetic material is, DNA or RNA, and how it's used can also vary. Then we're also gonna find in addition to that protein capsid, some viruses are also going to have an envelope but not all of them, okay? So it just depends on what virus we are talking about, but again, a great example of unity and diversity in this topic. This is a very important understanding here. Viruses infect a host by injecting its genetic material. So whether that's DNA or RNA, the way that a virus infects a host is by injecting its genetic material. What happens after that can vary. Viruses can either go through a lysogenic cycle or a lytic cycle. So we'll talk about the lytic cycle first. And the first step here is that that virus actually has to attach to a cell. So here's my virus. It's got its protein capsid and its genetic material, and it is attaching here to this cell. Now, attachment depends on like protein compatibility and lots of different things, but the virus must attach to the cell. In this next step, the virus is going to insert the genetic material into the cell. So if this is a virus with DNA, the DNA will be injected into the cell. So notice that that virus uh, protein capsid does not go into the cell, only the DNA. And then that DNA is going to go through several rounds of replication, so making quite a few copies. Next, we're going to go through the process of transcription. So if you haven't learned about protein synthesis yet, this may feel a little bit out of place for you, but in transcription, we're using the codes on DNA um, to make a copy of mRNA. So once we have mRNA, we can actually translate that mRNA into proteins. And guess what viruses are made out of? That DNA on the inside and then proteins. So once we have those, the viruses can start to assemble. And once that happens, those viruses literally burst out of the cell. The cell becomes very full of these like little baby viruses. And this word lysis actually means to burst, okay? So the cell, the host cell, will break open and that kills that host cell. Once that happens, then this virus can spread and we start all over again. So these viruses that are just assembled are now free to infect a new cell. And that's why we call this a cycle. So this is the lytic cycle um, and it involves lysis in which that host cell will burst. So what do we need to get out of this about the lytic cycle? Well, first of all, the virus reproduces and then bursts through that host cell. 
That means it's going to need to find a new host cell because it just killed the host cell that it used to begin with. Um, this is really common in things like plants and animals. So imagine you have trillions of cells. If a virus kills one cell by bursting it, there are new cells nearby that it can infect. And the same with plants. So there is a, a delicate balance here. If something is too virulent, that means it's infecting and killing host cells really quickly it's going to run out of hosts, okay? If it's not virulent enough, so if it's not killing host cells quickly enough, then the immune system will probably detect and destroy it. So the most successful viruses in the lytic cycle are just kind of in that medium range of virulence, um, and this is how they persist in an organism. Now the lysogenic cycle of a virus is going to start off in a very similar fashion. So that virus is going to attach to the host cell. And then in the next step, the genetic material, so let's say in this case DNA, is injected or inserted into that host cell. Now here's where the differences start to appear. Instead of being transcribed and translated and producing new viral particles, the viral DNA will actually become part of the host DNA. So I've drawn the host DNA here in red, and I'm oversimplifying this process a little bit, but the end result is that we have viral DNA becoming part of the host DNA. Now when this host cell divides, Okay, to create new cells, that means it's going to need to copy its genetic material first. Because that viral DNA has been incorporated into the host cell DNA, the viral DNA also gets copied and incorporated into the new cells. And this is really where the lysogenic cycle kind of gets its name. So this then goes in a cycle um, of new cells. Okay, so I'm making new cells, new cells, new cells all the time. And all of those new cells will have the viral DNA. It doesn't look like a cycle necessarily the way that I've drawn it, but cell division itself is a cycle. So these cells will produce new cells, which will produce new cells, which will produce new cells, and all of those new cells will carry that viral DNA. So in this lysogenic cycle, the genes become integrated into the host and it does not kill the host cell. And because of that, it is undetectable. So these viruses can incorporate their DNA into a whole bunch of host cells without ever being detected um, by that immune system. Now, certain stimuli can cause the lysogenic to switch into the lytic cycle. So this viral DNA can just sit here kind of like dormant and incorporated into the host DNA for many generations of cell division. Certain stimuli can cause the virus to all of a sudden switch into lytic cycle mode. And then once it's in the lytic cycle mode, then it's going to start transcribing and translating this viral DNA, making new viral par uh, particles, and then bursting those host cells. So the lysogenic cycle can turn into the lyti lytic cycle um, under certain conditions. So we've talked a little bit about common ancestry, which is um, a great example here of divergent evolution. So divergent evolution is when a common ancestor diverges into different species. We don't think this is the origin of viral particles. Remember, we think that there were probably many common ancestors for viruses. On the other hand, convergent evolution really kind of gets us thinking more about how viruses might have evolved from different ancestors, but to have some similar qualities. And one of those qualities that might be the result of convergent evolution is the fact that they have to have evolved um, to use genetic material. So that universal genetic code, like using DNA or even RNA that can be transcribed back into DNA, suggests that they have a common ancestor, but their other differences are more in line with this kind of thinking, that they had different common, or that they had different ancestors, but they both rely on cells, and then therefore both evolved to mimic the genetic material in cells because that's what made them successful. So that helps explain how different things from different common ancestors may have both evolved to have that same kind of genetic code. 
Now there's a couple of um, conflicting hypotheses for how this might have happened, right? So we have a progressive hypothesis, which says that viruses evolved from modified cell components. So different pieces of cells could have come together and that could have formed a virus. The regressive hypothesis is more like taking a cell and removing parts. So viruses could have evolved from a cell that had lost certain components. So there's evidence to suggest right now that both of these are good hypotheses. It'll remain to be seen uh, what happens in the coming years. As a potential host for viruses, one of the really annoying things is that viruses evolve rapidly. And because they evolve rapidly, that means our body's immune systems or even vaccines are often ineffective against new variations. So take these COVID variants, for example. If you got a COVID vaccine for one variant, but then the virus mutated and other, other variants infected you, your vaccine probably didn't work. So what is it that causes viruses to mutate or evolve really rapidly? Well, first of all, they have a very short generation time. So the shorter your generation time, the more generations you can have in a given amount of time. So lots of opportunities there for copying genetic material and for mutations to take place. And viruses tend to experience a lot of mutations. And again, especially those RNA viruses with no complementary base pairing, no proofreading of instructions every time that DNA, or sorry, RNA is copied, lots of mutations can take place. Mutations are the source of variation. And then natural selection is going to favor those viruses with genetic traits that help it evade detection. So viruses that carry genes that make it really easy for immune systems to detect them generally are less successful and therefore don't um, kind of like make it further on into future generations. So natural selection uh, is accidentally favoring those viruses that are better at evading our immune systems. And we'll look at how that plays out in two different viruses, starting with the influenza virus. The influenza virus is the virus that causes the flu, and it uses RNA as its genetic material. Now we already know that RNA mutates at higher rates, like more frequently, and this guy has not one, but eight different RNA molecules. So there's a lot of opportunity for a mutation there, and that means that we're going to have lots of different variants of this virus. Anytime there's a significant mutation or significant number of mutations, we'll have new variants. That's going to cause transmission potentially between species and new strains. And that has to do with these proteins that are on the outside of the virus. And these proteins are called antigens. So antigens, we have them on our cells too. Antigens are these little recognition proteins, and they serve as the attachment points for a virus um, to be able to connect to a cell, right? So the virus needs to have a certain shape and certain antigen that connects with proteins on the cell. Viruses can't connect with every cell. Their antigens aren't the right shape. But if there's a mutation in the RNA, then that could affect the shape of those antigen proteins, and that can result in a new strain. That new strain may be able to be transmitted between species, and that also means you can be infected multiple times because every time there's a new strain, it's able to evade your immune system. So that's why our flu shots only last one year. That vaccination needs to be given every year, and it only protects against a certain number of strains. If this virus mutates and produces a new strain, it renders the vaccine um, ineffective against that strain. Viruses like the influenza virus that mutate really rapidly can sometimes be very difficult to um, find vaccinations for. And the same is true with the HIV virus. So HIV stands for human immunodeficiency virus, and it is an RNA virus, but the way that this one works is it is reverse transcribed into DNA. So the RNA, instead of being made into a protein right away, is reverse transcribed into DNA. And that 
opens up the door for even more mutations. So does the enzymes that are made by the host. Those can also call this vi cause this virus to mutate very rapidly. And so this means that a person can actually be infected by multiple different strains of this same virus. When we say strains, we mean different mutated versions. So if you have several mutated versions inside of you at the same time, they can even combine to make even more <laughs> variations of strains. And so this is one of the reasons why the HIV virus is able to so successfully evade our immune system. It's always changing. As soon as our immune system learns what this looks like, it looks different. Um, and it's also one of the things that causes it to be drug resistant. So um, some really interesting things here about viruses and the connection to the immune system, which is also part of another topic.